So um, I want to welcome everyone to Linux Develops. The heart is the teacher. We're doing something in our inimitable way as the Vila Marcantonio form. We do a little drama, we do a little education, we try to make it a little fun. You walk away maybe knowing something that you didn't know before. Um, okay, so my name is Maria Lucella. And um, I'm part of the Vienna Marc Antonio Forum and also the Italian American Writers Association, um, which actually has nothing to do with this. Okay. First, I wanted to thank Sherry Lieberman, who's at the door trying to get in, for making available this lovely space, um, which I think is in one of the most inviting libraries in the city. It's cozy. It's nice. Um, they used new materials and old in what was a former chocolate factory in the cast iron district. Um, so if you look closely, what's kind of nice is this staircase that's, that you'll see that lets some natural light into the basement, actually, which is kind of nice. Um, okay. So I want to begin with a short review of what the VMF, the Vito Marcantonio Forum, had, is about, and a little bit uh, that will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Meyer, who is the former scholar of uh, Vito Marcantonio and probably the American Labor Party in this country. So, and then we'll have performances by Lulu Lolo, who many of you know, and Roberto Ragone, who's been impersonating Vito Marcantonio and, and sort of making him live again in a way. So, um, in the summer of 91, a small group of activists founded the first VMF. The purpose was to commemorate and continue the work of the radical seven-term congressman Vito Marcantonio. Later that year, on November 11th, the VMF and the Brecht Forum co-sponsored an all-day conference, the Multicultural Curriculum Recovering Progressive Traditions. There, the intention was to create an annual event, and there would be an award given to someone who embodied Marc Antonio's blend of radical coalition politics and humanitarianism. The first award went to Annette Rubenstein, no surprise there, whose edited collection of Marc Antonio's speeches, I Vote My Conscience, became a primer for anyone wishing to follow Marc Antonio's work. Rubenstein also played a major role in the American Labor Party. Although the Vito Marc Antonio Forum dissolved for a time right after that, the initial event served as a catalyst for future events. Um, on December 10th, 1994, fast forward, the East Harlem Historical Association uh, sorry, East Harlem Histor Historical Organization, Union Settlement, and the Italian Americans for a Multicultural U.S., or IANIS, sponsored a conference at the Museum of the City of New York entitled Vito Marcantonio and Co Coalition Politics. As part of the program, Pete Pascal, who personally knew Marc Antonio well and whose daughter Lulu Lobo today will be performing, um, he had devoted his life to the youth of East Harlem. He was presented the second Vito Marc Antonio Award. In May 97, the John D. Calandra Italian American Institute of Queens College sponsored a conference called The Lost World of Italian American Radicalism. And the plenary session was dedicated to Marc Antonio. At this event, um, okay, this event also resulted in a book edited by Dr. Myers and the late distinguished professor Phil Canistrado. The event actually drew around 500 academics and intellectuals from around the country. And in a way, it sparked the debate that was very long overdue, which was recovering the progressive tradition among Italian Americans. There, the Vito Marc Antonio Award was presented to Ralph Fascinella, renowned artist, who also knew Marc Antonio well, and he ran for city council on the American Labor Party ticket. Two of his most prominent canvases, Campaign Lucky Corner and Death of a Leader, depict Marc Antonio. On November 12, 1998, more than 400 people attended Vito Marc Antonio, a recognition and celebration at New York University, which Roberto Ragoni was pivotal in organizing. Um, and it was the largest gathering since the organizing committee who planned Vito Marc Antonio's memorial nearly 60 years ago in December, on December 7th, 1954. Fast forward to 2011, 15 people reestablished the VMF. 
with the intention of resuming our work and bestowing the Vito Marcantonio Award to an activist who best embodies Marcantonio's legacy. The recent activities, have in, our recent activities since 2011, have included the celebration of the fourth printing of Professor Gerald Meyer's Vito Marcantonio Radical Politician at the Brecht Forum. Um, on April 25th, 2012, there was the formal dedication of the Vito Marcantonio Conference Room at Ostos Co Community College at the behest of Professor Meyer. On November 28th, we presented a multimedia tribute to Vino Marcantonio and the Puerto Rican people, Solidarity in Progress, that was attended by more than 100 people. This was co-sponsored by the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College and the Italian American Studies Association. So gradually, more and more people are recognizing Marc Antonio in a sort of institutional way. On June 8th, several members of the VMF participated in the panel. Vito Marc Antonio, spokesperson for the left at the annual left forum at Pace University, which is on YouTube and can be found via our website. In the summer, we decided to do a guided walking tour of the historic Woodlawn Cemetery where Marc Antonio and LaGuardia are both laid to rest, commemorating the 59th anniversary of his death, Marc Antonio's death. So in November of 2013, the forum, forum sponsored a fundraiser at Gaetano's restaurant that included Roberto's inimitable renditions of excerpts from Marc Antonio's speeches. <coughs> and Phil Pascal dramatized Paul Robeson's statement when he learned of Marc Antonio's death, which had actually never been um, delivered because he was exiled. This year we're planning to bestow the Vito Marc Antonio Award on a recipient and we're planning a commemoration of the 60th anniversary of Vito Marc Antonio's death. Um, if anyone would like to work on any of those projects, please let us know and, and sign a sheet up there. Um, so I also like, you know, we've had like kind of a, a tradition of reading um, the litany to San Vito. This was actually a, a piece that was written, and, and we have it, and we've and we've read it kind of, kind of like as a kickoff to every event we've done so far. So maybe I'll have Gil read it, and then we'll begin with Professor Meyer. Should I read it? Yeah. Sure. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. Right from you, where you are. Okay. Litany of San Vito. San Vito of East Harlem, pray for us. San Vito, bread of the poor, pray for us. San Vito, crucified by Wall Street, pray for us. San Vito, martyr of McCarthyism, pray for us. From the jail cell walls, not San Vito, deliver us. From the backyard crap game, San Vito, deliver us. From the loan shark's vig, San Vito, deliver us. From the drunken stupor, San Vito deliver us. From TB and asthma, San Vito protect us. From the social workers visit, San Vito protect us. From immigration raids, San Vito protect us. From the landlord's greed, San Vito protect us. Amen. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce someone who has been really a pivotal character in all of this and that's Dr. Gerald Meyer. Um, born in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is now very she-she, but I don't think it was then. Um, he's the middle son of parents who never had the chance to graduate from high school, which makes Leonard Cavello's story even more poignant in the way Dr. Meyer has written about it in the afterword of the newest edition of the book. Um, Dr. Meyer is a founding member of the faculty of Ostos Community College. Initially an historian, he followed his convictions as an activist and educator, by, by chairing the Save Ostos Committee that kept the college open when CUNY Board of Higher Ed threatened its existence in 1975-76. He's currently co-chair of the Ostos Circle of 100 Scholarship and Emergency Fund, which actually helps students who are reaching just about the end of their graduation period and run out of funds. This mm -hmm. just sort of gets them over the hump, and I think it was like an incredible idea to come up with. Um, and he's also Professor Emeritus at um, Ostos Community College while continuing to teach now as an adjunct. 
The author of Vito Marcantonio, Radical Politician, 1902-1954, which is in its fourth edition, with Phil Con and with Phil Canistrato, he co-edited The Lost World of Italian-American Radicalism. Dr. Moyer is the foremost expert in the country on the subjects of Vito Marcantonio and American Labor Party, as I mentioned. He has published over 60 articles and reviews on a wide range of subjects, including the Italian-American educator, Leonard Cavello, focusing on radicalism, immigrants, culture, and the left. Dr. Meyer serves on the editorial boards of Socialism and Democracy and Science and Society. He's appeared in documentaries, reviews manuscripts for publication, and lectures widely. And actually, last night he had the, last night, two nights ago, he had the pleasure of speaking in front of Italians, Italians from, from Italy and New York, and it seems like a singles club. So I'm glad that you hit that, that, <laughs> that, that, that you know, that group, <laughs> that market. <laughs> He's been a pivotal character in re renewing and reinstating the value of Vito Marcantonio <laughs> and the fact that he's a humanitarian as well as a politician and that those two things are not contrary within Marcantonio. <laughs> so I'm so happy oh to my, thank introduce you. Oh Dr. Meyer. Really, thank you. Mama, I hope you heard that. <laughs> <laughs> That's very She's cool. so proud of you. Thank you. And uh, Gil, what Gil is making me think of is that you know, really, what the, the best hope for the left is that we develop a, a, a secular religion. Exactly. You know, we don't have a supernatural <laughs> God, but we have lots of saints. We really do, you know. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned that Rubenstein, you know, what a saint, you know, and dedicating her whole life and losing everything and not skipping a beat, not skipping a beat, you know. And, uh, you know, there's so many people that come to mind. Somebody's mentioned Caccioni to me, but they knew him. These are people who are, deserve our reverence, deserve our attention, uh, and that can help us persist in our own work when it does look sometimes so dismal and so, like it seems so often that we're just retreating. But, uh, you know, they're dark times, but ultimately we're right, and uh, people cannot tolerate the way they're living. And at some point, our message will be heard for sure. And I think keeping the memory alive of the others that have been uh, shunted off to the side will also encourage us to know that we'll be remembered in this struggle as well. You know, so glad to be here. It's such a pleasure. The people I haven't seen in a long time, you know. Oh, my God. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Well, the secular saint, Cavell, Leonard Cavell, what a great man. What an extraordinarily great man. I, I have this notion that he, that I think that he's probably the single most important figure in the Italian American experience. I think he's, I think he is, and I think he is because he's the only Italian American coming through the immigration and coming forward that had an alternative for the Italian American community, an alternative to going off into the twilight and leaving behind uh, physical, uh, material uh, elements, but, but losing uh, the community and the culture. And I think he really did more than any other Italian-American to offer an alternative. And that alternative is uh, what would be called cultural pluralism, you know, a term that's, that's foreign to even people on the left, although that was a project of the left is that the immigrants had a right to keep their own culture, that, the, that they needed to be part of the society, they needed to learn English, and all the help should be given for that. But in the process, it did not mean they had to forget their languages, their cultures, and their ties with their uh, co-nationals elsewhere. And that in the process, that would be better for them, that would be better for their families, that would be better for their communities, but it would also be better for America. And that the Americanization process was really part of a general right-wing conspiracy to, uh, to, Anglo to make Americans into Anglo-Saxons so that they could uh, thereby be, uh, in a sense, absorbed into the dominant culture and manipulated, and in the process, offer no resistance to capitalism. And one of the, the major points uh, was to really, which has really been almost totally forgotten, is in, in 
but really to one, I think on the left, particularly the Communist Party, was with black and white unity. And the second part was the right of cultural minorities to their language and culture. Those were two pillars within that movement. And I maybe we've lost both, but certainly the one for cultural rights for minorities uh, has been largely forgotten. So, but Cavello approached the question of cultural pluralism from the perspective of education. And that was really a very special contribution that no one else made, that he really made an application of the theory of cultural pluralism to education. So that's so critical. It's so critical. The failure of education today everywhere. Everywhere we look, the total failure, wipeout of education. But he's offering, he's offering hope. He's offering strategies that can succeed. But he's really worth knowing about. We have his book. We're not allowed to sell books, but it is ten dollars donation. This is half price. <laughs> <laughs> this makes a wonderful, wonderful holiday present. Don't tell me you already bought one. You know somebody that needs this. We all have nieces and nephews. You can't give, you give them to your children. Go. Nieces and nephews. Give them to nieces and nephews. Anyway, you put the children in the will and you give books to nieces and nephews. Now, in any case, so so the idea is we have a ten bucks, a really great. I wrote it afterward. I was reading this, that's pretty not too bad. Anyway, so anyway, <laughs> I'll try not to repeat the afterward here. But um, I li the afterward, uh, they, they allowed me to have a title. Usually, usually in the afterward, you just, just as afterward, like, oh, duh, you know, really, along with all the other afterwards that were ever written in the, in, in the history of, of, of literature, whatever. So I was very pleased that they allowed me to have a title. And my title was Leonard Cavello, Educator, advocate, humanitarian, humanitarian. We don't hear that word anymore. That word is gone. What, uh, there's a kind of basement of language here. We don't hear the word humanity anymore. No. Humanity. The left at one point spoke for humanity through a struggle for the working class, that the working class was the best hope for humanity. Where did that go? How did we lose all of this? Well, we can, we can regain some of this, I do think, by retracing these steps and bringing it forward. And not that we would try to recreate what was lost. I think that's, that's not healthy or helpful or possible. Even though I feel like I'd love to do it. You know, I really would if I could. But, but, it, but it can't be done. But I know this is going to be so inspirational. To, to look back at these giants, these wonderful people that did not, never got their recognition in this country. Their names were erased, their, their reputations were distorted, taken from them. Well, it's our job to fix some of that. You know what I mean? For, well, for them, I mean, who knows? I mean, the chance is one in a billion, but they might just be up there so well, who knows? You know, really, we don't know until whenever. So that's one thing, but I think it's mainly for our own self-respect and to feel quieter about the possibilities of justice in the world, and including ultimately perhaps for ourselves personally too, and people that we know very well. But Cavello uh, was an immigrant that arrives when he's nine years old. But I think we have to stop and think of that. We have to think of the incredible contributions of immigrants. Here we're talking about this great, great figure in American history. I mean, he's this huge figure in the Italian-American community, but it's really, he belongs to everyone, ultimately, and especially to the immigrants and the immigrant experience. And to, in terms of education, to all of the groups that struggle in our, in our school system and, and don't do well. But he really, I think, developed a, a remedy that he called community-centered education that's applicable to all, not just to Italians, it was applied later to the Puerto Ricans. I think it's applicable to African Americans and to all cultural minorities uh, in this country of ours. Um, and uh, I, I think that um, uh, he's such an important person. I mean, he's just such an important person. And and uh, but but he's an immigrant. And I think we have to think of all the immigrants, how much they've contributed to this country. Einstein. Toscanini, I mean, it's endless. You know, the authors, uh, Louis Adamich, forgotten person, wonderful, wonderful name. 
I mean, it, it's endless. You know, in every nationality, writers, composers, uh, scientists, educators, and the workers, the people that, that dug out the tunnels, that, that plowed the land. My grandmother lost a finger in a, in a factory when she was 14 years old. I said to my grandma, I said, Grandma, what happened to you? I thought she <coughs> lost it overnight. I hadn't noticed, you know? And I was, I think, maybe five, six years old. She goes, oh, she goes, oh, that. She goes, oh, she's, oh, I, I, I went to, I went, I had to work. So I went to a factory, and they said, are you uh, 16? She said, sure, sure, I'm 16. She goes, you have experience? She goes, yes. She goes, where did you work? In Cherry Street. She never, it was her first job. The first day she was here for yeah. I said, what happened? She goes, they gave me half a day's <laughs> Good old day. You know, Mark Antonio said that the immigrants are the cannon fodder of industrial capitalism. Uh, that's really says the whole thing. I mean, but here we, we have to stop. I think we're rushing ahead so much. I think we're just, you know, immigrants that we're rushing on. Oh, what else is here? What happened? You know, what happened? What happened? What happened? But to stop and, and really honor that, you know. Uh, what's so missing is that, you know, the sense of Americans all. That was a very big slogan in May Day parades. Americans all. We don't hear anything like that. Without slogans, without figures, important figures, without institutions that can disseminate this information, that can embody, materialize, and embody this information, People just drift along with whatever bounces around them and uh, they adopt that. Because there really isn't a competition for that, for anything, except what is this ridiculous uh, you know, message that we get from, a, from, from other people, you know, to dictating them what's, what's in our brains. You know? But this offers a resistance to that. You know, when we can't always make political gains, we can resist culturally. We can, now, we don't want to oh, just stay there. You know, the point of that is to, to gather strength to, to make real change in society. But when real change is not possible in society, we can do research, we can develop culture, we can create community, and until we have the strength to, to, to challenge power, to make things better for humanity, and specifically for those who are left out, which includes more and more and more people as we speak, that are being left out. So this is very valuable. But Cavello's story is, is just really one of these stories where it's, it's like he's an, exe an exemplar of the Italian-American experience, immigrant experience in general, but really the mm -hmm. Southern Italian experience. It's like, it's like it's, you know, it reminded me in the, in the jungle. Remember the jungle, you know, <coughs> Claire Lewis? You know, Jurgis, that was my father. Like, he, like every job, he'd get injured, and then it was a worse job, and he'd get injured, it was a worse job. Anyway, so in any case, but, 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 but it was sort of like, but Cavello was like the exemplar, I think of a Southern Italian immigrant. He arrives at nine with his mother and a couple of siblings. There would be more later. His father had arrived earlier. Absolutely typical. But the Italians, the father came first. The Irish was often the mother or the woman at this came, but there were more women. The only group were more women. Jews arrived as families. They very often didn't have all enough passage, so some people left behind until, but basically they were arriving as families. But the Italian, it was also overwhelming. The men arrived first, very often expecting to return. And then setting up a household, and then calling for the rest of the family to arrive. That was a perfectly typical arrangement. And uh, so, this follows that pattern right there. And, uh, and then, when they arrived, they lived among themselves. The Italians were the most segregated group, residentially segregated group in the United States, including African Americans. They were the most hom homogeneous uh, communities that existed. Uh, they, they lived in this kind of archipelago of Little Italy. So you can see they were, they were actually, many of them were contiguous in, in some piece. And then they would go from a center outward into becoming somewhat less Italian going toward the borders. But 
in the very heart of, of Italian Hall where they settled, it was basically 100% Italian. It's amazing, these very large communities where they began to replicate uh, their Southern Italian experience. Uh, and uh, what the Southern Italian experience was that in Southern Italy, there were peasants, most of them. There were also crafts <coughs> of Artigiani. They were either peasants or Artigiani, uh, you know, crafts people. But they lived in towns. They did not live on the countryside. I mean, people would get that wrong. The same that Jews lived in shtetls. They lived in, in market towns for the most part. That you know, the Southern Italians lived in, in, in towns which were rather sociologically quite complete. There would be an upper class. It, it went, and the richer you are, the higher you are. Uh, physically you are, in terms of the hill, going down, 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 and down. But the vast majority of the population of the town would be peasants, very few of whom owned land. And then what they would do is they would leave the town every day to go and work in the field, sometimes this way, sometimes that way, and uh, return late at night. It was during harvest they would actually stay and sleep in the fields. But they lived in towns, and they lived there incredibly tightly populated towns, densely populated towns, and uh, where they live with multi-generational families in this really very kind of complex society that they had. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so, so when they arrived in America, they begin to re replicate this. And, and what they're, by replicating it, they want the density. They're not looking for what we would think is so critical for us, like privacy. They wanted sociability. They wanted to see everybody, to be there, to be seen and to see all the time, and, uh, and to stay there. The idea was to stay. The Italians are the most uh, spatially loyal people in the world. The volcano erupts, wipes out the town, they wait till the volcano <laughs> cools off, they start to rebuild on top of the lava, you know. I mean, they don't want to go, you know. I mean, when it's, you know, there was a, a, an old joke, oh my God, we have some people that might, might have heard this one. But when I was a kid, this was like, I don't joke, whatever. So how do you know when a Jewish kid, an Irish kid, an Italian kid come of age? You know that a Jewish kid comes of age when he wins an argument with his mother. <laughs> you know that an Irish kid comes of age when he wins a fight with his father. And you know that an Italian kid comes of age when their parents build them a house in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and where I grew up, there were lots of both houses. I mean, you know, if you go to any of the little there, there are no more Italians there, but the ghosts are there. I mean, you look, just look in the back, there's a house. <laughs> and, uh, but the idea, but, so this was a, a replication of that. And then in, then in the Little Italy, there would be a church. But like, like Southern Italy, the men rarely went to church. They went there for rites of passage, you know, for baptisms, definitely for weddings, and absolutely they were there for the funeral, you know. Um, that was, you know, and then as they got older, the women get revenge. You know, the old, they really get revenge. So at some point, they have nothing much to say about anything. So they got to do. They, oh, they, 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 I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. And then they get, so the women that originally take the children to church, the children run away. So now they got the they got the old man. They got to take him to church. So, but this was again a whole kind of replication of what was occurred in southern Italy, down to incredible details. You know, there was some blending with the with the new society, certainly. But it was a remarkable thing. I, the great accomplishment, I think, of the Southern migration was a little bit of it, it, It's masterful to, for people to have recreated uh, in an adaptive way uh, a, a defense, it was defensive. It was a defensive arrangement so they could survive in, in an incredibly hostile situation. They're peasants. Where do they arrive? in the middle of, of the metropolis, the great metropolis. You know, many of them had never seen the sea. Had never seen the sea. They were in these mountain towns. They had never traveled anywhere, even to another town. And now they're in New York City, where there are no jobs involving agriculture. You know, this is an incredibly difficult transition. They were illiterate. Italians spent the first generation learning Italian. When they arrived here, they didn't know Italian. They knew dialects. 
And they had to learn Italian to survive where they were. Not English, they had to learn Italian, which they did not know. So the first generation is basically about learning Italian, learning how to read, but learning how to read Italian. And the readership of the Italian language newspapers was enormous. So somewhere along the line, the illiteracy part was maybe misinterpreted. It was illiteracy in English, but they were becoming literate in Italian. If people do not become literate in their first language, there's little hope that they'll ever gain any literacy in a second language. That's why bilingual education does make sense. Yeah. I'm telling you, if somebody doesn't get their first language, they're never going to get a second or a third or a fourth. So in any case, um, so Cavello, uh, when he arrives at nine, his father was already here. Not only is he in Little Italy, in, in Italian Harlem, which was the largest Italian American community at that time in all of the United States, Italian Harlem was from 96th Street, East 96th, up to 125th Street, and from the East River all the way over to um, Second Avenue, you know where the, the viaduct is, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was like 90,000 first and second generation tents. First generation means we were born abroad. Second generation means that uh, one, one pa uh, parent uh, had, uh, well, at least one parent has parents that were born abroad. Third generation, you know, and so on. But the, the census, 1930, they only accounted for first and second generation Italians. So you have to add the third generation, you're talking about 120,000 people, mm -hmm. all within this incredibly small area, really. And in Italian Hall, it was the largest the largest little Italy. So it, 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 it became, I, I think uh, people have said this, I think it's probably true, as far as I could tell, it became the most Italian of the little Italy. It became culturally very, very Italian. And I think that had simply to do with size. Like, except for you know, getting a job, there were some jobs there in services, you know, in, in stores and so on. Uh, you had everything was there, everything. You didn't have to go to step outside to continue your life against something like Southern Italy again. So uh, Cavello arrives into the situation, but they're not just living with other Southern Italians, they're living with other Southern Italians that come from their town, from uh, uh, Avigliano in uh, Basilicata, one of the very poorest areas Absolutely. of Italy. Southern Italy is much poorer than the North, and within the South, uh, Basilicata is one of the two poorest areas in, in Italy. Huge, huge source. She's just asking if you could speak a little louder. Oh, sure. You know, actually, you could just move closer. That a, a huge source, a huge. I thought people. One of the major reasons people like. I was always given. I was always given like uh, getting gigs to talk in um, uh, old age homes because you know, I talk so loud. I was born in Hoboken, and like we have goats on the hills. But I'll try. I'll try a little bit higher. But Thank you. you're welcome. To. But the idea is that. Uh, with um, that, so that you have within this community of Southern Italians, it's all subdivided according to region, according to village, and so on. This is the environment that Cavello arrives in. His mother was illiterate, very, very common, and I think showed signs of massive depression. She basically didn't leave the bed. And this, and, and Edward Corsi was again a very forgotten figure, also from Italian Hall, uh, he describes his mother doing the same thing. They both arrive in America and they collapse in bed. They won't get out of bed. It's so different. It's so mm -hmm. overwhelming to mm -hmm. them that they couldn't manage it. And then they died. You know? And it was just unbearable for them. I mean, anything that made sense to them, anything that they could experience, it was, it was, like, it was like arriving in Mars. They couldn't tolerate it. How many of women were in that category? Was it 10%? Was it 50? You know, we don't know about those people. That's why these memoirs are so important. You know, and we don't have many of them. But the Corsi and Cavello both wrote these more, very wonderful memoirs. A Corsi's memoir is not as good, but it's very good. It's The Shadow of Liberty. And the Shadow of the Shadow of Liberty. It's, not a, it's a good book. But when, so when he, arrived, when he arrives here, he, soon there are now going seven children mother and father in three rooms. That's it. With the bathroom in the hall. And, uh, and they lived that way. How did they live that way? 
He shared the bed with three brothers. My two brothers shared a bed. I got my own bed. Hmm. I wonder why. I don't know. In any case, but it was incredible how people had to live, how the immigrants had to live, and how, how bad the situations were for the Italian Americans. And everyone is expected to work. That they had to, everyone had to find some way to bring something into the household. If you, you know, go forward, I think they can hear me sure. better. Sorry. And then, sure. And then to find something, some way to bring something into the household, you know. And um, so they're destined, and Cavello started working very, very early, delivering bread. People got, you know, bread delivered, you know. Uh, and, uh, but he goes to, he goes to, uh, to a settlement house. That word is lost, settlement house. Why? Settlement house is, uh, we would say today, a community center, mm -hmm. but it's not identical with community center. The distinction is, in the settlement house, the staff lived on the top floor. Oh. And that's where the settlement house, and they were almost always Protestant women who didn't write. It was kind of like Protestant nuns, you know? <laughs> and something really, in a way, and, and what they did is they went know, into these ghettos and live there with the people um, forever, sometimes, or until they might have retired. But they live there uh, to provide services, to provide help, and uh, they were part of the progressive movement. They were all part of the progressive movement. Some were socialists. Um, uh, and, um, and they were uh, motivated a lot by the social gospel, many of them. That, that would be for more from the Methodist Church than the Presbyterian Church. There was some motivation about uh, living as Jesus lived and, and, and from the social gospel. And, uh, but they started out with a very Americanizing uh, project, but they tended over time to, uh, to be more and more sympathetic to the immigrants and to their cultures. And they started to become more multicultural in their work. Well, Cavello goes to one of these settlement houses which, is that, which was originally called the Home Garden. Today is called the Guardia House, still on East 116th Street in East Harlem. And, uh, but for many years was known as Harlem House, which was the most famous settlement house in East Harlem. And he goes there, and the founder of the um, Home Garden is Anna Ruddy from Canada, a Methodist from Canada. And she takes him under her wing. She doesn't have children. The more I'm looking into this, there's a lot of that. You know, who has children and who doesn't have children? Family is very good, but it's also very selfish. You know, there's a lot of selfishness in family, you know. And uh, I remember my, uh, my mother, her best friend's mother died and left my mother quite a few things. My mother gave it to her friend's son. I was furious. I thought that belonged to me by right. The fact that my mother got her, the only, the only, you know, little, little kind of bequest she ever got a couple of the rings, the little chips and stuff. I thought that was mine. What do you mean you got that you get it? You know, but this is the selfishness of family, you know. <laughs> so, in any case, but what I'm, when you see more and more, a lot of these people who are acting in a very, very socially conscious way, Cavello had no children. Mark Antonio had no children. Oh, Ned Rubenstein had no children. I mean, it goes on and on. So, in any case, it's, in some ways, it's better to be like it's better to be good to nieces and nephews. You know, leave the money to the children, be good to nieces and nephews. But in any case, so the idea is uh, that uh, with uh, Cavello, is he goes to the settlement house and everybody really adopts him. She adopts him and uh, and sets him on a trajectory which was most extraordinary. First, to graduate from high school, not a small thing. The very the the, the the academic progress of the Italian students was abysmal. There were 25 percent of the enrollment of these of the students in the public school system. The tendency was for the Jews and Italians to go to the public school, and for the Irish and the German Catholics to go to the Catholic schools. That was overwhelmingly. We could talk about that later if you'd like. Or other pattern. And so Cavello goes off to a public school to. Morris High School, good school, and uh, through the help of Anna Ruddy, but he, the, the family problems become so intense with his mother getting sicker and sicker, he drops out of school, and uh, when he dropped out of school, nobody said a word. 
the principal, the teachers, nobody in his family, nobody in his family said a, said a word. And he starts to work. And uh, a neighbor, who later he marries, from Aguiliano, uh, says he should go back to school. And he goes back to school, and he graduates, and Anna Ruddy, through her intercession, gets a Pulitzer Scholarship for Cavell. He goes to Columbia College. And now he goes to Columbia College, and he also gets a master's. This was most unusual, indeed. So his plan is, you know, he's becoming little American now, is onward enough where he's going to teach in college. And he, he uh, but he's, he had, he had thought he should get a part-time job in the, in the first, so he starts to work in Dewey Clinton High School, which is where the current John Jay is. It's the same building, the beautiful, beautiful building. It later moves, you know, uh, to the Bronx. But that's the original Dewey Clinton. And when he gets there, there are very few Italian students, and they were doing terribly. So he starts to get very motivated about what to do with these kids. You know, they're doing miserably. And obviously, he associates with them, with them very, very much. And um, then goes off to war and returns, thinking he's going to go to college. But in the meantime, his mother has died. The children are being scattered. There's a need for money. So what does he do? He stays. But this becomes very interesting. He's following the ethos, the southern, uh, the southern Italian ethos, that what is primary is family, and that you can't interpret success as an individual. Success is only meaningful in relationship to family. He's following that. He went to Columbia. He's a smart guy. He read a lot of books. He's been outside the community, but he's responding to that set of values and that the prime, his primary responsibility is to his family, and he stays. But, does it, but I think what's so important is how tragic. If he had gone to Wellesley, we wouldn't be talking about him right now. <laughs> you know, I mean, we got to keep this in mind. You know, you really think that, you know, it's about turning adversity to advantage. You know, people that are thrown off track, and they, they take a harder road, those are the people that ultimately amount to something. The people that took the easy path, that got a break, the people that got a break, you know, to take an easier path, they're just, they're too happy. You know, I mean, they're like, you know, I sometimes worry about people that are too happy. What are you so happy about? You're happy. You're happy. You're happy. They would be happy. Oh my God, yeah, what a baby. So, but the, I mean, the more tragic the situation is, the more likely it is you're going to like care about them and certainly write about them or listen to them or anything else. You feel like happy, happy. You know, anyway, they pass into oblivion. You know, like on their their epitaph. You know, like in, in the, their epitaph on the on the monuments. It says, she was very happy. You know. <laughs> so then, then when the the, the clergyman is here, she goes, "Well, we're here to." to very our dear friend, and she was one of the happiest people I ever knew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this stuff, every you no, know, let's get out of here. No. So, uh, what's for lunch? But in any case, he took a much harder path, but he really made something from it. He's now in the Clinton High School. Well, what could you do? You could teach all the courses. You could teach elementary French, and elementary Spanish, and then Spanish too, and maybe intermediate Spanish, and maybe intermediate French, and do it over and over. Over and over and over. Instead, he pays attention to the Italian people. And coming, and that becomes his mission. Wendell Phillips, a great abolitionist, he was a, you know, kind of a happy, we should know more about Wendell Phillips. We don't know about Wendell Phillips. So, in any case, great, great name. And um, so, in any case, somebody said it was very, very late in age. He said, he goes, they can't hear you. They can't hear you. You have to go forward and talk louder. Can you hear No, you have to. You have to step up and talk louder. Uh, David bugs you, right? Okay. Is it okay. Take a deep breath and talk louder. <laughs> okay. He wants you. So uh, Wendell Phillips said when he was asked about you know um, when he was asked Mike's. about you know what, what's it like to be happy? Uh, why is he happy? He said, that, and what is the form of being happy? He said, the way to be happy is to adopt an unpopular cause and stick with it for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, uh, this but what he develops does, he develops instinctively, based on mm -hmm. his experience with the settlement towns, uh, he, uh, he just organizes them into a circle of Italiano. 
So now all the Italian kids, or most of them, are now simply together. And the assumption coming from the settlement task is simply that act of bringing people together is powerful. That's the same message of any religion. People go to church, they think it's the Holy Ghost. No, it's each other. It's everybody's little light. Everybody's little, little twinkling light that now they're together. Every AA meeting, every sub, you know, whatever it is, it's all about just being together. If you didn't say a word, the, the, the question is right. You don't have to say a word. You sit there. And something's going to happen. You feel stronger. You feel more optimistic. And, and he gets that. But once they're there, he sort of has a plan. And the plan is very interesting. It involved two large pieces. And this is what he spends his life in, in elaborating. The one is the culture. That for them, for the students to learn Italian culture. And to reconnect them with who they are. So they are proud of who they are, and they don't feel less than the other students who are not Italian that are doing so much better than they are. That they have something of value, that they have something worthwhile. But they have to learn that. Otherwise, they don't have access. Uh, they don't have access to that as a strength. So the only way they can have access to that as a strength is by the knowledge of it. But then there's another piece. The other piece was, again, from the settlement task, is to do service. He said these are the weakest kids in the school. What does he do with the weakest kids in school? Not ask for tutoring. He sends them to the community to tutor. There are a thousand studies about what happens with tutor and tutoring. Who benefits from the, uh, that program? The tutors. The tutors all succeed. The people are being tutored. <laughs> <laughs> it's the tutors that get ahead. You know, I mean, it, you know, when they say it's better to give than to receive, that's completely true. You know, when I heard that as a kid, really? <laughs> sure. You know, that in, that in limbo, I, did, I didn't believe either of those two. In any case, I mean, that was too much. I mean, that was beyond the beyonds for me. But in any case, but, but the idea that, you know, that, that the, the really what he, what he did by sending these kids back to the settlement house, Hall House, we now be Hall House, and the other settlement houses in Italian Hall and the other little Italy's by doing that, that was connecting them to their community. So they're not becoming alienated. Uh, he later, things happen when people in the group. I think about our own group, the Vito Mark and Tony before, and how we've all adopted projects. People are writing essays, people are going into the archives to look at the letters that the constituents wrote and making performances on, people are making videos, people are, are developing websites, people are writing poetry, people are organizing meetings. None of that would have happened if we were all staying home. None of it would have occurred. And by just by being together, there's a synergy in, uh, in that situation which, and support, which is, uh, enables people to develop themselves. And in the process, the group becomes stronger, which has more resources for people to draw upon and so on. Powerful. All of that is con contradicted by the fundamental ethos of this society, which is me first, individualism, you know, think about yourself, pay, take, take care of yourself, you know, so, which is leading to what? I mean, people just taking more and more pills. I mean, there, there's so many pills. I had a friend that was going to Europe. I said, are you all passionate? I, I don't care, okay, I have my 857 pills. She said that and didn't know why the doctor wanted to see her to renew the prescription, wouldn't do it over the phone. He should have kept her home. You know, in any case, she was at mortal risk. But anyway, so, but I think the idea is with, uh, something happens. A student asks Cavello, why do we have to study German? Which Cavello had to do in grammar school. They were teaching these Italian kids German. It's almost beyond belief. They're coming from Villiano. They're coming to Italian Hall and part of the curriculum is <coughs> German. Why? So the student says at Dewitton, why do we have to learn German? Why do we have to learn? Why can't we learn Italian? Well, there was a reason. The reason was, at that time, 
Italian is not acceptable for the requirement for a um, for a degree, for, the for, a, diploma, for a diploma, high school, for an academic yeah. diploma. And so, uh, Cavello, first of all, started an Italian class without any of that being responded to. He did two things. One is to develop the class. And by developing the class in Italian, guess who was in a student in his class? His first class, you don't want to tell So that begins this wonderful story where I learned about Cavello. But it now spreads ultimately to a campaign organized by the Italian uh, Teachers Association uh, to make Italian a language <coughs> with equal um, value toward uh, obtaining a degree. Once that was done, it was possible to have Italian language classes throughout uh, New York City. And the, the use of, of Ita the, the teaching of Italian was widespread, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of students. Now, so Cavella puts this together and he elaborates this further and he, he, because he's only doing this in deal with Clinton things. You know, the Italian is beginning to be toward Elder Benson or all over the place. But he's but looking at the, the, the fate of the twenty-five percent of the public school system who are Italian kids, he's saying that there's a need for another approach. And and he first diagnoses the problem, I think perfectly. He diagnoses the problem uh, to say uh, diagnoses the problem by saying to, uh, that the problem is this: that the ethos in the uh, the ethos in the family in the community is fundamentally based on family loyalty, and the ethos in the public school system is fundamentally individualism, and there's incredible conflict. And the, st and the students in high school resolve that conflict by withdrawing from the school. So there has to be an accommodation for these students, otherwise they are not going to persist in school. So he develops an extremely remarkable <coughs> pedagogy called community-centered education. He's appointed principal of, uh, of a new high school, Benjamin Franklin High School in Tallinn which is founded with the mission of implementing community-centered education, where the community will provide leadership for the community, be a community center, think about the, sort of, about the, uh, uh, the settlement towns, be open at night for the community so that the parents are learning English and the students are learning Italian. Remarkable, it worked very, very well as long as there was the help of the WPA workers. Later it begins to descend um, it's, some, it's a great, great story. And uh, Cavello just, just he, he's the principal until 1956. He then works with the, uh, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, applying the same work to the Puerto Rican school children. And in the last 10 years of his life, uh, when he was 83 years old, he returns to Italy, but not the Basilicata, to Sicily, and he works with Daniela Dolce, Wow. He won the Stalin Peace Prize. And um, I don't know much what am I doing this way, but anyway, well, he won the Stalin Peace Prize. But in any case, he worked with Daniel Dolce uh, with the uh, unemployed workers in Western Sicily. He right. dies in 1983 uh, and is buried in Messina, uh, Italy. It's a great story. Buy the book, buy a couple of them, uh, give them to other people. No, you have to this say is donation. somebody we donate. want to donate. Donate, no donate, donate money. Donate money is always a good thing. And, uh, and read the book, read the book. And if you want to work more with us, we would, we would love to have you. Right, we have the sign-up sheet in the back. And um, this is a perfect segue, actually. All right, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. This especially is pertaining to the dramatic struggle of women in New York City's past. New York City's past. Um, I don't know if many of you know her piece on the Saracena girls from the Triangle Shirt Race Fire, but if you get a chance, you must see it. And another character that she's playing soon, on March 12th, Wednesday, is the Kitty Genovese story, uh, which many of you might have remembered. Um, she's a Lower Manhattan Cultural Council writer in residence, and she's been named a 2013 Blade of Grass Fellow. She's the daughter of the late community leaders, Pete and Rose Pascal. 
uh, and Lulu's family history spans 100 years in East Harlem. Her childhood memories of Vito Marcantonio, Edward Corsi, and Leonard Cavello are woven throughout her work. Let's welcome Lulu Roland. note this morning before I came here I gave a tour of East Harlem to 20 uh, City College students introducing them to Mark Antonio, Cavallo, Edward Corsi and I showed them all the landmarks. So this first piece is a reading from the book directly. Forty-five years of my life I spent as a teacher in the New York City public schools. Twenty-two years of these years I was principal of the Benjamin Franklin High School located in the East Harlem district of Manhattan Island. In this long lifetime of teaching, I have learned much about the ways of immigrant peoples and their American-born children. I was an immigrant boy myself. I know what the American school can do to maintain family unity. I also know how the school can function as the integrating force in our democracy and in the molding of young citizens. After half a century as teacher and principal, <coughs> I retired with the greatest regret. But I went back, back to work with migrants as educational consultant in New York City to the Migration Division of the Department of Labor of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. I am trying to give the latest of our migrants, the Puerto Ricans, what I tried to give to the Italians and the Negroes, to the Irish and the Germans, to the rest of the nationalities and races that make up that human mixture known as East Harlem. My time, my affection, and above all, my understanding. For only he who has suffered directly or indirectly the degrading insults of what? or nigger, or spit, or mick, or kite, or we, whatever else the unwanted or newcomer <laughs> to this land is called, can readily understand. From my window of my office at the Benjamin Franklin High School, I can see the East River Drive and the surging traffic of high-powered motor cars. It is Wednesday, the last Wednesday in August. For me, it is the last Wednesday in school. It is the end of my life as a teacher in public school. It seems impossible. I, I cannot quite convince myself that it is or could be the end. I have walked into a New York City classroom 45 years ago. Life for me at that period stretched interminably into the future. I always felt that my life in the school would go on and on until my last day. I know that in September the now empty classrooms and the silent halls will once again feel the pulse of life as the boys my boys pour into every nook and corner of the building and take over as they have done for so many, many Septembers. And I will not be there. It will still seem strange not to stand again on the front steps and watch them as they converge upon the school, greet them as they come up the steps. Children of the great metropolis, Negroes whose parents migrated from the Deep South, Italians whose parents had forsaken the poverty-ridden villages of Southern Italy, 
Puerto Ricans from the stricken island in the Caribbean. Irish, Jews, Germans, Finns and Swedes, migrants from every corner of the world, from near and distant places, people on the move, uprooted people, disinherited, seeking a new and better way of life fleeing from lands where oppression and exploitation had been their daily lot in search of the land that would give them the status and dignity of free men. Once more, the exuberance of my boys will fill the corridors. Their energy and vitality will fairly burst the seams of this great building as they pour in. I see them, the fair-haired and the dark, in the colorful array of their clothing and the pigmentation of their skin. How difficult it is to leave them. I get up from my desk. Beyond is the East River, catching a brilliant reflection of sunlight. In this dazzling blur and in the pain within me, I see another land and another sun and the first of all these leave takings which are part of life and at the same time a bit of death. Wow. Wow. Our next performer, a member of the Vienna, Roberto Ragone, he has more than 25 years experience with the public sector, in government, nonprofits. He's known to a lot of people as this little dynamo. Um, he works with the New York City Council and New York City Mayor's Office, served as Executive Director of Lower East Side Business Improvement District. And as a consultant, he, con he conducts strategic planning, market fundraising, marketing fundraising, and advocacy for nonprofits, small businesses, and arts-related projects. He's been on the theat theatrical production teams, acted in showcases, and most recently in the off-Broadway production of The Odd Couple. Um, Roberto's going to take on the role of mm -hmm. seven-time elected oh, East no, no, no. Congressman. No? Initially. That's what I have. No, it's oh. Lapino. We're doing... Oh, uh, you doing... Okay. 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 Feeding first, okay. Right. Sorry, I thought you had... Are you doing this together? Okay, yeah. sorry. So the two of them are going to... He's going to be... She's Dr. Cavello. And he's going to do a clean on the terror. Okay. Oh. I'll let you go. <laughs> oh, you need the chair? Yeah, no. You were typecast. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you got time. Just sit right there for a second. Uh, this is Lulu Lola. I'm Dr. Cavello. I'm Lupino the terror. For the moment, the terror of 108th Street. She's Dr. Cavello. Okay. This is about a barrel chested Italian boy by the name of Lupino who in his early school career had caused the dean and teachers a great deal of trouble by fighting in the corridors and disrupting his classes. <laughs> what he felt when he felt like it he would get up and walk out of the classroom and return at his convenience. <laughs> he was so rugged and powerfully built that few dared provoke him. Finally, after repeated trips to the dean's office, the dean brought him to me with a note from his teacher. This troublemaker is more than I can stand. I do not want him in my class. I had talked with Lupino before, underneath the characteristic sulking and resentful attitude of a boy in trouble, something else struggled for relief. There was a feeling of life that was irrepressible and would not be changed. After letting him sit in a corner of the office for a while, I finally looked up from my desk and said, all right, what is it this time? You know, you got the report. I want you to tell me. That English teacher, she hates my guts. It seems everybody in this place hates my guts. Just a minute. Come over here, next to my desk. Don't shout. When you shout, I can't hear anything. Now then, in a low voice, what were you saying? What's the use? 
When something goes wrong, I'm right there to take the blame. You know what I mean? You mean you were born unlucky? <laughs> That's me, all right. You can say that again. And you can say that this time your uh, bad luck carried you right out of school because that is what the dean wants and that is what your teachers want. And unless I'm very mistaken, that's what you want. This was not what he wanted at all. He wanted to finish high school even if it killed him. There had to be one member of his family who graduated. It was just that he was unlucky. I had often come upon this particular contradiction. Uh, I know how it is. You know what you want inside, only somehow you act just the opposite. Your mind gets away from you. Before you know it, you've forgotten what the teacher is talking about. And when she catches you, you get mad. But you're not really mad as a teacher. You're mad at yourself. Uh, it certainly looks like I'm in a mess. You certainly are. <laughs> and at your age, it's the kind of mess that will wind you up in jail. But why should you worry? It's what everyone expects. Your teachers, the dean, you yourself for that matter. It would not surprise anybody, probably not even your mother and father, <laughs> another East Harlem kid go going wrong. <laughs> this time, I haven't any choice. I've got to expel you. How can I run a school like this? How can anyone who wants to learn make any headway with you in the class? Please, Pop, i got to finish high school. I was in a spot. I would have to appease the dean and the teacher. Besides, his mother and father were Italian, and it would look as though I were making an exception. If you make more trouble, it will be on my neck. I, I promise, this time, I give you my word of honor. I won't let you down, Pop. I swear on the soul of my dead grandmother. <laughs> I don't know. Let me think about it. Go home. Come back tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> the teacher was young, new to East Harlem, and could not wait to be reassigned to a school in a better neighborhood. I knew it without her telling me. She'd been raised in Pelham, a peaceful suburb of New York, and this was her first regular job. Lupino was too much for her. After a few moments in my office, she broke down and started to cry. It's as if he ridicules me. He's utterly contemptuous of everything I say. They're in class and always conscious of his presence, like, like some animal ready to pounce on me. I, I've never handled such a student. Tell me, Mr. Cavallo, how do you do it? I don't know. It's easier for me, I guess, because I was raised the same way and I've lived all my life in the same neighborhood. As Filipino, if he disturbs you or the class in the least way, just let me know. He'll be out of here that very day. But let's give him another chance. I know we can straighten him out. After she'd gone, I sent for Lupino and made him write a statement. To the effect that, uh, at the very first adverse report, I would voluntarily expel myself <laughs> from school, period. <laughs> Lupino kept his word. He graduated. I never had cause to regret what I had done for him, nor his teachers, for that matter. A few years later, Lupino came to present me to... <laughs> hey, this is my girl, Dolly. We live on the same block. 
I have known the most of my life. I'm working in a garage. I like fooling around cars. In a couple of years, when I've got some money saved, we'll get married, Dolly and me. Then I'll save some more and pick up a gas station and a service repair place someplace. That, that's what you've got all figured out. How's that strike your pop? How's that for old Lupino who you thought was heading for the clink? <laughs> uh, boy, these kids today, I'm telling you, Pop, I saw a bunch of them just yesterday breaking bottles and emptying garbage cans on the street. I said, what's the matter with you guys? You got sawdust for brains or something? Not even a bird don't follow up its own nest. <laughs> After we finished the coffee, Dolly rose to gather the cups and saucers and bring them to the washstand in the corner behind a screen. I made her sit down. Oh no, you are a guest here. He'll wash the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter with you, Pop? You want to spoil my wife before I even get married? Wash the dishes. It'll do you good. At home, I help my wife. It's about time you started to learn. I will always remember that hulk of a boy named Lupino. Lupino, the terror of a hundred and eight street, <laughs> who could probably lick any two boys in the school put together. He was not a student every teacher would be proud of. He would never set the world on fire and the school would never inscribe his name on its honor roll. At best, he would own a garage and raise a family, that's all. But when he picked up those dishes and said to his girl, <laughs> this Pop Cavallo, he sure is one for the books, huh? <laughs> I knew all over again why it was that I was a school teacher. So, the next piece, Lulu will be playing Dr. Cavello again, and she's reading from a piece from, uh, uh, er, that appears early in the book, What's in a Name? One day, I came home from the soup school with a report card for my father to sign. It was during one of these particularly bleak periods. I remember that my friend Vito Salvatore happened to be there, and Mary Arcuso had stopped in for a moment to see my mother. With a weary expression, my father glanced over the marks of the report card and was about to sign it. However, he paused with a pen in his hand. Eh, but what is this, he said. Leonard Cavello, what happened to the eye in Caviello? My mother paused in her mending. Vito and I just looked at each other. Oh, well, my father insisted. Maybe the teacher just forgot to put it in, Mary suggested. It can happen. She was going to high school now and spoke with an air of authority and people always listened to her. This time, however, my father didn't even hear her. From Leonardo to Leonard, I, I can follow, he said. A perfectly natural process. In America, anything can happen and does happen. <laughs> But you don't change a family name. A name is a name. What happened to the eye? <laughs> Mrs. Cutter took it out, I explained. Every time she pronounced Caviello, it came out Cavell. So she took out the eye. That way it's easier for everybody. My father thumped his fist on the table. And what has this Mrs. Carter got to do with my name? <laughs> what difference does it make, I said. It's more American. The I doesn't help anything. <laughs> it was one of the very few times that I dared oppose my father. But even at that age, 
I was beginning to feel that anything that made a name less foreign was an improvement. Vito came to my rescue. My name is Victor. Vic, that's what everybody calls me now. Zika, Stika, Nika, you're crazy in the head. My father yelled at him. For a moment, my father sat there, bitter rebellion building in him. Then, with a shrug of resignation, he signed the report card and shoved it over to me. My mother now suddenly entered the argument. How is it possible to do this to a name? Why did you sign the card? Now, Duccio, you will have to tell your teacher that a name cannot be changed just like that. Mama, you don't understand. What is there to understand? A person's life and honor is in his name. He never changes it. A name is not a shirt or a piece of underwear. My father got up from the table, lighted the twisted stump of a Toscano cigar, and moved out of the argument. Honor! He muttered to himself. You must explain this to your teacher, my mother insisted. It was a mistake. She will know. She will not let it happen again. You will see. It was no mistake. On purpose. The eye is out, and Mrs. Cutter made it Cavella. You just don't understand. Will you stop saying that? My mother insisted. I don't understand. I don't understand. What is there to understand now that you have become Americanized? You understand everything, and I understand nothing. <laughs> With her in this mood, I dared make no answer. Mary went over and put her hand on my mother's shoulder. I beckoned to Vito, and together we walked out of the flat and downstairs into the street. She just doesn't understand, I kept saying. I'm going to take the E off the end of my name and make it just Salvatore, Vito said. After all, we're not in Italy now. Vito and I were standing dejectedly under the glass lamp on the corner, watching the lamplighter moving from post to post along the cobblestone street and then disappearing around the corner of First Avenue. Somehow or other, the joy of our childhood had seeped out of our lives. Mm -hmm. We were only boys, but a sadness that we could not explain pressed down upon us. Mary came and joined us. She had a book under her arm. She stood there for a moment while her dark eyes surveyed us. But they don't understand, I insisted. Mary smiled. Maybe someday you will realize that you are one who does not understand. Wow. opportunity to say a few words as to why Leonard Cavello, or more accurately, Leonardo Caviello, in honor of the name his parents actually bestowed upon him, why he is so important in the field of education and in my life. First of all, for those of you who were not in attendance at the November 13, 2013 event, of the Vito Mark Antonio Forum at Gaetano's restaurant, it is there that I explained that it's possible for me to return to this world despite my death on August 10, 1954, to address you as an advantage I've been given in my state of limbo for Cardinal Spellman's refusal to give me an official Catholic burial. <laughs> Now, perhaps when Pope Benedict abolished limbo, I was liberated. <laughs> so being that I am still barred from heaven and apparently don't deserve hell, perhaps I am here with you 
by special dispensation from the current Pope Francis, who has been recently quoted as saying that he knew many Marxists and they were good people. <laughs> and I guess that doesn't make me so bad since I probably defended the First Amendment rights of some of those Marxists. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Cavallo, Dr. Cavallo, or Pop, the name I gave him that caught on with all the other students, he wasn't just a thinker. He wasn't just a philosopher or a theoretician. He had the opportunity to lay out a hypothesis about learning and then manage to test that hypothesis as a teacher and a principal. He introduced an innovative form of learning. Learning by experience. Learning by practice. Learning by action. Learning by participation in the civic affairs of the community. He demonstrated that theory in application is what mattered. He understood that learning by immersion is what mattered. Now, Pop changed the way we should think about school. It was more than book knowledge or being trained for a vocation. It was about how children can transform their own personalities to become imaginative, creative, and even entrepreneurial for themselves, their family, their local community, and the broader society. The staff of the school and the school building itself can foster a larger sense of purpose. The school can be a beacon. He developed the term community-centered education. The idea of what people might term today as a one-stop center for children engaging in their cultural heritage and extracurricular activities for personal development and maturity. And for busy parents taking lessons in English, in civics, voting and becoming actively involved in their local community. He certainly had no problem putting me to work <laughs> to illustrate the benefits of connecting to your culture and your community. As a student in his first Italian class at Dewitt Clinton, then as a volunteer at the Harlem House, and then as a founder of an Italian student group at NYU, and then as a founder of an, and then as a congressman, bringing more housing and a high school to East Harlem. He inspired me to remain as a resident and an active participant in the community rather than take the more typical path of the American dream. I was fortunate to have Leonard Cavello as an intellectual mentor as much as I had Fiorello LaGuardia as a political mentor. Now, Dr. Cavello wanted to bridge the gap between immigrant children and their parents and with people of all races, creeds, and backgrounds in American society. In fact, even though the newspapers tried to hype up a racial incident between African-American and Italian-American students in September 1945 and blemished Benjamin Franklin High School after Dr. Cavello's many years of success as a principal there, oh, how the media never seems to change, they failed to report how Dr. Cavello and I got Frank Sinatra to sing at the school and got the Italian and African American boys to march arm in arm in the Columbus Day Parade. Now, how Pops Cavello managed to get a photograph taken with Frank Sinatra and I didn't is something I never quite understand. <laughs> <laughs> but people should cease and desist. People should cease and desist in reinventing the wheel when the solutions to problems in education were with Leonard Cavello all along. We should embrace and customize inventions in modern times 
that Mr. Cavello endowed us with many years ago. Now, I was asked to read a tribute in Dr. Cavello's book. Before I do that, I ask you, do you believe I have properly honored Dr. Cavello with my remarks? Thank you. <laughs> so you'll go on. Will you read about Vito Marcantonio, a student to well known? Okay. So Here. this is a piece that Co Coviello wrote about <laughs> Vito Marcantonio as from student to well known New Yorker. Where did that appear? Was that in the Heart of the Teacher also? Yeah. yeah. That's um, in the back. Okay. Here's a passage from the Heart of the Teacher. In the old copy, it's, an old copy, it's page 152. The same pagination. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Can I have a change? No. The name of one of my East Harlem students was to become well known to New Yorkers. He was Vito Mark Antonio. Mark, everyone called him. Sort of stature and slender of build, Mark was a volcano of energy. He became involved in everything that had to do with the Circolo and the Italian department. Some of the students called him a socialist, though I am sure that not many of them had any idea what they meant by it except that Mark was always discussing world affairs, politics, and labor conditions. Once, I unexpectedly came upon Mark berating a group of fellow students. Quote, You birds don't even know you're alive. I'll bet you this very minute there's somebody, some guy out there trying to figure out a way of making money off your hides when you go out looking for a job. You don't even know that, unquote. There were enough students around who disliked Mark's offhand commentary and, quote, socialistic, unquote, tendencies to keep him from being elected president of the Chircolo. This did not bother Mark. Instead, he managed to have the organizational setup revised and had himself elected chairman of the executive committee with powers over the president himself. <laughs> when he had accomplished this, he came to my office and told me about it, laughing for all it was worth. Whoa. Pop, <laughs> you are now looking at the chief executive of the Chircolo, unquote, he said. Mark was the first to call me Pop, a name which many, which my boys have used ever since. This was when Fiorello H. LaGuardia was president of the Board of Aldermen of New York. The war, World War I, was, a, was recent enough so that everyone still called him the major. Dr. Paul, the principal of Dewey Clinton High School, asked if I could arrange to have the major speak to the boys at our assemblies. It was a good idea. LaGuardia could be very stimulating, particularly to young people. They were attracted by his facial expressions and they loved his act. The way he would sputter and hiss and pound his fist in his palm. And they would listen to what he had to say. I sought out LaGuardia at his office and he readily accepted the invitation. It was in the days when he would go anywhere and any amount of trouble to make a speech. However, in order to give the occasion an added air of importance, we decided that a student speaker should precede LaGuardia. As a graceful gesture towards LaGuardia's Italian background, Mark was selected. It would be difficult for anyone to forget the startled faces of the students gathered at the assembly that day when Mark stepped forward on the speaker's platform and said, quote, this morning, I am going to talk about old age pensions and social security. Unquote. I had known that Mark was going to talk about it. Now I was hoping he would put it across. In a few minutes there was complete silence. In the auditorium as Mark's impassioned voice pressed the argument 
for providing for the old age of people who with their labor had helped to build America and who had never been able to earn enough money, more than enough money to feed their children and pay for the clothes on their backs. He spoke passionately, eloquently, and I know sincerely. Quote, for if it is true that government is of the people and for the people, then it is the duty of government to provide for those who, through no fault of their own, have been unable to provide for themselves. It is the social responsibility of every citizen to see that these laws for older people are enacted. Unquote. The applause which followed as Mark backed away from the lectern convinced me more than ever that adolescents are far more capable of serious thought and understanding than they are credit they are given credit for being. While other boys could poke fun at Mark and kid him along, when he spoke, they listened. But Wadia shook Mark's hand, slapped him on the shoulder in a congratulatory gesture, then in his own inimitable way he thrust out his chin and picked up the thread of Mark's speech and used it as the basis of his own talk. Quote, Our neglected citizens, quote, his audience howled. Assembly that day was a huge success. The students, Dr. Paul, and all the teachers were pleased, even excited. Most important of all, for LaGuardia and Mark Antonio, it was the beginning of an association and friendship which would endure for many years. Almost as soon as he had finished law school, Mark went to work in LaGuardia's law office. He came involved in politics and managed LaGuardia's congressional campaigns in East Harlem. When LaGuardia was elected mayor of New York in 1933, Mark was elected to replace him in Congress. So I'll say to that that Dr. Cavello was being a bit modest there because the collaborations between Mayor LaGuardia and myself and Dr. Cavello are really made an impact and are model case studies worthy of examination in schools of education, but also in schools of business and public policy. Most importantly, I hope the humanity of our collective efforts will be rediscovered and replicated by the current mayor and others. Thank you very much. So, okay, that's the actual official close of our program. However, I want all the people from the Vito Mark Antonio Forum members to stand up. If any of you would like to be on a mailing list, um, do you want to come in and so I can say who the members are? Um, there's Dave Giglio on video, Rosemary Siciliano on video, Gil Fagiani, Louis Romero, Adam Meyer, and Charles Bayer is back there. So you can leave your name with any of those people. Um, we do have events coming up uh, probably shortly. But I also want to bring to your attention that Anna Filomena is one of our members who just published a book called So You Want to Be Italian. And to remember that there are flyers here. Lulu Lolo is going to have a stage reading of the 50th anniversary to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Kitty Genovese. Uh, yeah, there's yes. the information here. There's flyers here. And, and um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.